in this boosting topic so far, we've been focused on the classification problem, but it also applies to the regression problem. And this is the, the topic area of gradient boosting. Just as with classification boosting, we're learning a sequence of regression models. And uh, the job of each model is to try and predict the errors from the previous set of models. And what that means is that uh, if we've set things up properly at each step as we add more and more models uh, to the ensemble, then the total error uh, of prediction by the ensemble will actually drop uh, with each step. So let's look at a bit of the math. All right, with our training set, we still have uh, example feature vectors. So we'll call those big XJs. And we have uh, YJs. And now the yjs are continuous values instead of classes. When we go and, and learn some uh, model, I'm going to call that f, f of xj. Our prediction, that, so this, is, this yields some sort of a prediction, and we'll refer to that prediction as, uh, as yj. Now if uh, this is a perfect uh, predictor, then this yj here is going to match uh, the uh, true yj. And, and we can talk about how well that matches. So let's define ej here as uh, being equal to yj minus yj hat. And in the learning of our, uh, of our uh, f here, if we're, if we're using a, a mean squared error criterion, then we're going to uh, select the parameters of our f uh, such that we uh, minimize our mean squared error. All right, so this is our standard story with, uh, with, with regression. And, uh, and now let's imagine a scenario where uh, I have a second model of some, uh, of some form. I'm going to call this model uh, F2. And we're, we're going to assume right now that, uh, that F2 is actually uh, able to uh, exactly predict that error. So F2 is uh, sub j is equal to uh, ej. Then, then uh, let's try adding our two Fs together. And I'm not saying I know where F2 is going to come from, but uh, but we'll work on that here in a moment. So, so with that, let's let's go ahead and plug in our our values here. So, uh, f of x j that's equal to y j hat, and uh, and we made this assumption here that f two is equal to e j, and that is equal to y j hat, and e j is defined right here. So this is uh, y j minus y j hat, and if we simplify, we're down to y j. So the, the insight here is that uh, if this assumption is true, then this summation here, this is a perfect predictor of, uh, of the data. So that's a great place to be. Uh, in practice, this, is not, th this assumption does not hold. Uh, and instead, our F2 is only going to be an approximation of EJ. So let's, let's go ahead and, and write this model here. Uh, so, so this assumption is, no, is not actually true. So, so, let's, so we have our, uh, our yj, our true value. And let's assume that we have this summation, fxj plus f2 of xj. And we're going to define this to be uh, another error. And we'll call that e2, comma j. And as I go forward, I'll probably drop that uh, comma there. Uh, this is y j minus f x j. So we're making an assumption here that f x j has already been learned, and it's it's a constant. As is y j. So I'm going to group those two things together here, and we'll compute this as uh, we'll uh, pull out this F2. And, and in some sense, this sort of looks like a, 
a an error uh, in and of itself, and in fact, this yj minus fxj is uh, is right uh, uh, if we uh, combine uh, this term here with this term here, we can rewrite this as being equal to ej minus f2 uh, xj. So, so what we're what we're trying to do is is get our f2 to be equal to uh, ej as close as possible. But in practice, there's going to be some sort of a difference, and we're going to call that e2j. All right, so, so the next step here is let's select uh, the parameters of F2 uh, such that uh, we minimize the mean squared error, uh, this new mean squared error that we've uh, selected here. And this is E2 comma J squared. So we can continue this, this whole process and uh, define uh, a, uh, a new error, uh, E3j, which is our difference between the, the true value and a set of uh, three functions. Uh, and uh, so, so there's our new function there. And we can go through the process of learning the parameters for that. We can then, uh, after we've done that, we can uh, define an E4j and an E5j and on down the line. And, and as, we, as we go, we're, we're growing more and more ensemble members. Of course, we're increasing the number of parameters that we have with each uh, step here. Uh, but if we set things up properly, with each step uh, from three to four to five, our, our mean squared error uh, is going down. At some point, of course, we might get to a point where the number of parameters is, is getting too large relative to our training set, and we might begin to overfit. Uh, but uh, at least from the perspective of the training set, performance is always going to get better if we're also factoring in a validation set, that performance, we would expect it to start to turn upwards as we begin to uh, overfit our data. Okay, so that's, that's the general idea behind uh, gradient boosting. In order for this to work, the, one of the keys is that our, all of our Fs, uh, these must be nonlinear. If, they, if the Fs are linear, then we, we understand from linear algebra that uh, taking two linear functions and adding them together still gives us a linear function. So, uh, so the representation capability uh, does not at all uh, uh, increase in adding more ensemble members. But if the ensemble members are nonlinear, then, uh, then we can uh, use this to our advantage to uh, build up the right size ensemble to uh, represent our function better than an individual ensemble member can. Okay, so let's let's do a a quick example here and give this a a shot here. This is still gradient boosting. And the, the book gives you an, a number of examples as well. I'm going to give you a slightly different uh, perspective that will kind of give you a sense of what's going on from one step to the other. Um, so uh, suppose, suppose I have a, uh, a data set that looks uh, something like this. So there's our, our horizontal axis and there's, I'm sorry, our vertical axis and our horizontal axis. So these are our, our true Ys. And these are our x's. So this is a one-dimensional feature space. And, and imagine that we have a set of samples that uh, do something like this. These will be easier to, uh, to draw around. So there's our function, or at least a set of samples. 
So, so we're going to use a decision tree here. Uh, the simplest interesting decision tree is one where uh, we have just one question. So let's, let's go ahead and set that up. So let's imagine us building, so our decision tree is going to look like this. There's our root node, there's our question, and it's going to be x is greater than or equal to something, and then we'll have two leaf nodes, and those will each predict a, a value. Now, I'm not going to be terribly precise here about where to uh, draw the boundaries, but uh, just sort of eyeballing things, I'm going to draw the boundary right here. And so that is, if this is the origin here, uh, then that is at x equals 5. So when x is greater than or equal to 5, what's the mean of all the points on the right-hand side here? And uh, that mean probably sits somewhere about here. So this is uh, the yes branch and the no branch. Uh, so the yes branch sits at a, makes a prediction of four. And uh, on the uh, left-hand side, the mean of the points eh, sits probably right about in here. It's not exactly a horizontal line, but it's close. So that's four, 10, 11 and a half. So this is 11.5 here. Actually, let me redraw this line here since it's going to be uh, very important. So we had it sitting right here. There we go. Okay, so, so what I'd like to do here, so this is our, our first level approximation of our function. Uh, it's not so bad. Uh, but what is now error as a function of, of xj? So, so here's our, uh, our definition of uh, ej here. So yj is our true value, yj hat is our predicted value. And, and this uh, this red line here, the two horizontal pieces, that's our predictions. Let, let's generate a plot of ej as a function of xj. Okay, so for this for this point here, uh, my error is is here, and so this is a uh, a positive error here, and for this point right here, my error looks like this, and that is a, a negative error. Oh, over here, uh, for this point here, the error is this. As I'm, we're predicting that 11 and a half, and, uh, and we're, we're uh, missing that by, uh, it looks to be about four, three and a half. And by the way, that's also a positive error. Okay, so let's, uh, let's try, Let's generate a plot of all of the errors as for one for each of the samples. And the easy way to do this is actually to, uh, to just copy the two sides. So copy that. And I'm going to drop it down over here. So the errors are all being measured relative to uh, the red line, and so the trick is going to be to to copy the the left and the right sides uh, such that uh, the two red lines actually line up with one another. I mean, I get all the points, but this certainly will uh, make the point here. So, so now the the two red lines get lined up. And uh, let's switch over to another color. So this is now our EJ, or our E1J, if you want to uh, continue the, uh, the pattern there. And this axis here is still XJ. And, and you'll notice now the variance of, of these values is quite a bit smaller than the uh, variance of, uh, that we had in the original set of data. 
Okay, so now, uh, so we've learned one model, and now let's learn a second model here. So again, a root node here and a question node, and it has two leaf nodes. And it's a good question for, for this set of data, where to put the split. Um, I think what I'm going to do is put the split, uh, and this is somewhat arbitrary here, but I'm going to put the split right there. This is at x is 22. And to the right-hand side, let's say our, our mean line is sitting right about there. Let me actually make that truly horizontal. So this is negative 2.5. And the mean line on the uh, on the uh, left hand side, it's kind of hard to tell, uh, but uh, let's go ahead and draw it in right here. So this is uh, positive 0.5. Okay, so, uh, so if we were to add this, the results of this tree to the results of uh, this tree here, then we would actually have a, a better approximation to uh, this particular data set. Um, let's go ahead and draw in, we wanna know what E2J is, and, and we go through the same process to make that happen. So I'm gonna copy the, the data on the uh, right-hand side here. And let's drop it right there. We don't need that red line anymore. And, and let's copy the data on the Left-hand side, I'm gonna lose one of my data points, but that's okay. And again, the purple lines get lined back up with one another. Get rid of red line there. Okay, so, so that is our, uh, our new function here. So this is, this axis here is uh, E2J. And this is a zero error right there. And this is xj uh, along here. If we were to compute the mean squared error over all of those points, it would be uh, a bit smaller than we had with uh, the mean squared error with ej. So, so from here, one could uh, imagine, I probably would put the next uh, split, say, right here. So that would correspond to a tree where uh, we're asking a question about X again, and this is relative to 15. The yes branches on the right-hand side and the no branches on the left-hand side. Sorry, those are uh, swapped. Uh, but on the uh, left hand, uh, the right-hand side, I would probably put the value at about one. And on the right-hand side, let's say negative two. And, uh, and from here, we would, we would go and compute our E3J, and the, and the process would be the same. We clip out uh, the right-hand side and the left-hand side, align those two blue lines, because that's our, that corresponds to error equals zero uh, at that point. And, and at each step in this process, our mean squared error is actually going to uh, be dropping. For this particular form of decision tree, uh, mean squared error is going to probably continue to drop forever, uh, but the amount of drop is, is going to start to become quite minuscule. All right, so that, that's the, the essence of what uh, gradient boosting looks like. In, in practice, we're going to use somewhat more complicated decision trees for our individual uh, ensemble members. Uh, but in reality, we're actually going to stick with pretty simple decision trees. So it's not uncommon for us to use a depth of two or a depth of three a decision tree, and then to have uh, lots of uh, different estimators. So next up, we're gonna try this uh, in code.